Hey everyone, this is Tracy Friedlander. You're listening to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. Welcome back for season four of Crushing Classical. I'm so excited for what's in store this season. Today on the show, I have John Pickford Richards, violist and co-founder of Jack Quartet. John and I discuss how the quartet that he and his friends started in college evolved from a college chamber group to a full-time career and nonprofit entity. We talk about financial implications of taking the leap from band to business and what goes into making chamber music a full-time career. This interview was very eye-opening for me as John goes into detail about raising money, how the group gets paid, and how they transition from freelancers in New York to a full-time chamber musicians. But before we start, a couple of things. First, I've started a mailing list to keep you informed of new episode launches and other crushing classical news. As your gift for signing up, you'll get a free PDF download, Three Ways Becoming Visible Can Revolutionize Your Music Career. Thank you in advance. The link to sign up is in the show notes. I'd also like to thank Fix Music for sponsoring Crushing Classical. Fix has been my sponsor since the beginning of the podcast, and their business continues to grow and provide even more value. They now offer business accounts for choruses, orchestras, libraries, churches, and universities. This includes volume discounts of up to 25%. Of course, they continue to offer free shipping on all domestic orders, and they've also partnered with FedEx to offer two-day shipping at insanely low prices, even to Alaska and Hawaii. They continue to expand their catalog with everything from high-quality jazz method books to elegant hardcover or text editions and everything in between. They are happy to take suggestions and requests from their customers, so if there is something you need, reach out to them through their website at fixmusic.com. They'll be happy to get it for you. And as always, use the discount link in the show notes to receive 10% off your first order at Fix. Let's get started. Thanks so much for being on the show today, John. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So you are the violist of a string quartet called Jack. Jack is an acronym, right? It is, or it was, I should say. It's a cool name, and it's an acronym. <laughs> so tell me how you came across, or how you decided on the name Jack. Yeah, well, you were right. The Jack is an acronym for the first names of the founding members of the quartet, mm-hmm. John, Ari, Chris, and Kevin. And before we were a quartet, we were students at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, and we came together to play a piece by a German composer named Helmut Lachenmann, and that piece had a subtitle that was an acronym for the first names of the Arditi Quartet members. And we joked that if the piece had been written for the four of us, it would be called Jack. And eventually that piece led us to need to have a name. Um, And so we just decided to call ourselves Jack. And it's been 13 years. Wow, that is such a cool story. And lucky that you that your name that your the first letters of all your names spelled an actual name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting because now we have two new members. Well, not new anymore. They've been in the group for three years, uh-huh. um, and so it's not an acronym. It's more of an homage to the founding of the quartet. Um, That's cool. So it's sort of taking on just more of a a brand or you know a meaning of its own. Yeah, and you can't really be like seeking violin must have last name or first name that starts with a K. <laughs> yeah. Well actually you know. so our violinist was the A and our new violinist is also an A. Oh well, that's but great. The, yeah, the cellist didn't provide a K though. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me more about Jack. So you started by playing a piece, a new piece and it was it sounds like you, you came together for one piece, and it wasn't, it wasn't the kind of thing where you're like, let's start a group with the intention of creating a career. Exactly. We had no grand plans. Um, I think a lot of classical chamber ensembles start this way, that uh-huh. people get together, and they're like, hey, this is really fun. Let's do it some more. And then there's a desire to turn it into something, or in the case of Jack, uh, it, you just sort of fall into doing stuff. Okay. So that that's what happened with you guys? Yeah, one opportunity led to another, and it wasn't like we were suddenly super busy, but we were motivated, and we were, you know, we were grad students or undergrads, and 
um, we didn't have other obligations right uh-huh. after school. Um, we were we were sort of different ages, and so that's a that's sort of a really fertile time to start a chamber ensemble because there's uh, people aren't being pulled in too many directions yet. Yeah, <laughs> and so we we tried to book as many concerts as we could and just play a lot and we would rehearse however much we needed to. You know, it was, it was great to have that kind of freedom right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and bef- pro- probably yeah. without like, correct me if I'm wrong, but without the concern so much about money because you're just in school. So you're like, let's just play. Yeah. 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 And maybe it was a good timing actually, because it wasn't long until suddenly we money became a real a real necessity because um, yeah. we graduated again, sort of at different times, but and people went on to like different amounts of grad school, uh, right. but but ultimately we did uh, swarm around New York City, which is of course an extremely expensive place to live, and we had to make a lot of uh, meaningful decisions, I should say. Yeah. So as you're as you're leaving school, so some of you were still in school and some of you weren't. Is that how it kind of staggered? Right. Yeah. So were you? Um, were you? Were you at? So I kind of want to know, like, did forming this string quartet direct you in your career, maybe in a way that you didn't expect it to, or were you thinking about one your career one way in college? Um, tell me a little bit about like where you thought your career was going and. I don't know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, did you think that you were going to have a different career before you formed the group? I personally did think I was. You know, I always love playing in the string quartets, and I worshipped the groups that I thought were great. Yeah. But I never really understood how one got in that position. I just uh-huh. blindly idolized those groups. Isn't that so common, too? Like, you're just like, oh, I want to do that, but I have no idea how. And and that, for some reason, you don't, like, question it. You're just like, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, and it's funny. In retrospect, I I can remember all this interesting advice that teachers would give me early on that that ended up being really valuable advice, but I just didn't see it then. You know, like, my high school viola teacher said, one of the most important things about choosing what school you go to is thinking about where you're going to meet the people you want to play with for the rest of your life. And I was thinking, well, I'll just play with whoever I want to play with, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll audition for orchestras and I don't, you know, but, but then it ends up that everything I've done has sort of been related to the people I met in school or through those people. So did you choose your school intentionally like that or was it just a lucky choice? I think my school kind of chose me. It was, uh, I, again, I went to the Eastman school of music and, mm-hmm. Uh, I was already really interested in contemporary music by the time I went to college. I had been composing and uh, and working with a lot of composers. And uh, and Eastman at that time had a ton, and still um, had a ton of new music activity going on. There's a great conductor there, Brad Lemon. There's a student organization that puts on concerts of new music produced by students. And um, I just got in on all that, like on the ground floor. And, um, and there's... I think schools are kind of like this, that there are waves of, of interest that sort of flow through schools every 10 years or so. And um, out of that, uh, those years at Eastman came the New Music Ensemble, Alarm Will Sound, Jack Quartet, oh, wow. um, a, bu- a bunch of other chamber ensembles uh, that are doing really cool stuff, and just a general interest in, in putting on concerts of unusual stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. It's sort of and, like and you rode the wave with that. Exactly, and I... And again, like I didn't necessarily realize that I was, what I was getting into, um, but it's exactly what I wanted and what I needed and what has propelled me forward since. That's really great. That's really great. So as you left, you, you said you were kind of sticking around New York City. Um, did you have to do a bunch of freelancing in the meantime before you kind of got the quartet up and running as a business? And we'll get to yeah. more to the business stuff later, but I want to know kind of like, what were you doing in that interim time? Yeah, well, I, I sort of thought that my trajectory was going to be to be a like, freelance new music violist, which is a thing. It's not like a super common thing, but I was in an ensemble called Alarm Will Sound. It's about a 20-person ensemble that plays new music, and uh-huh. it wasn't full-time, but I was it was regular, and I was able to do freelancing, playing new music in New York, just odd things here and there. 
Um, but then I also was trying to just do more conventional freelancing and orchestras and um, chamber music or just anything, recording sessions. Anything and, that paid. <laughs> yes, anything. And teaching, I sent my resume to make every music school for all any every age. I mean, not college age, but... Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had funny auditions and interviews, and uh, I learned a lot just through trying to get those jobs, like what I what my strengths are and what my weaknesses are. Uh-huh. And, um, and then through all of that whole period, Jack Quartet was getting busier, and then it just led to that being the thing I did eventually. That's cool. That's cool. So now, now that Jack exists, that's, is that your entire, um, living wage? Like that's what you, that what supports your lifestyle now? Yeah. Um, Jack Quartet decided at some point to go to a salary system rather than per gig. Oh, wow. Um, you know, really the main deciding factor of that was that we had to, it got to a point where we needed to be rehearsing, um, so much that we had to turn other great opportunities down just so that the quartet could rehearse. And, and so we thought to ourselves, well, if this is going to be all the time, then we need to be able to have dependable income. And I think our our initial salaries were hilariously small, um, completely unlivable, but it was, but they were dependable. And there was a sense that if we kept working and trying to grow our bookings and as a nonprofit, uh, that our salaries would eventually grow, which they did. Right. Okay. So we, I want to definitely dive into the fact that you're a nonprofit because that's probably really mainly how you can go to that salary way of being, right? Yeah. Having it as a nonprofit. Yeah. So, um, so like, let's back up a little and go from, like you had mentioned on a previous call that like initially it was sort of like you had a mindset of, of that you're a band. Like we're just a group of people who are, we're friends. We love playing together, but eventually you had to transition to being a business and behaving like a business. So how, what was that transition like? Like what were some of the steps that, or maybe realizations that you had? Like, okay, we got to change this, that, and the other. Like I, you said, one of them was that you needed to rehearse more. Maybe you weren't so much like, let's take every gig we get asked to do, but you sort of, you sort of kind of streamlined like what you said yes to so that you could rehearse and probably learn new music. So what was, what were some of the other things that you had to do that you kind of, that you did to transition over to like, this is, this is a business. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of a slow transition because the band mindset is very flexible because the band decides how much time they want to put into it. Whereas, for instance, starting a business um, or putting on like a concert series or something that has fixed expenses, uh-huh. so you can't just you, you know. So you, in those situations, you can only you can only do as much as you can spend. But in the case of a band, we can we can put as much time as we want into it. Uh-huh. And so in, in the beginning, we had so much that we had that luxury that if we decided, we just block off an entire week and just rehearse, you know, three pieces for eight hours a day or something or right. until whenever we wanted. We didn't even have fixed rehearsal times. We would just rehearse as much as we felt inspired to rehearse, which was a lot. Uh-huh. And and there were no financial consequences to doing that. Whereas, like, in an orchestra, you have to pay, you know, the union fees or yeah. whatever the fee is. Um, and... Uh, Right, and that band mentality still we still have it. We don't we don't like keep track of like how many hours we rehearse or do administrative work. Um, so I'd say we actually still have the band mentality. But like I said before, when the need to turn down other sources of income became real, we um, we recognized that we would need to be financially dependent on on the band, and then there was suddenly more urgency to both commit ourselves more time to it, meaning like making more concerts happen and, and, and truly investing ourselves in it. Um, but then also finding ways to make more money than gigs could offer. I see. Yeah. It sounds like that would be probably the place where anyone would get where you, when you realize okay, if we want this to happen, we have to turn down these other gigs that 
that bring in money. And then in doing so, we have to replace that income with income from this thing that we're going all in on. Yeah, essentially. It, was, it was real. And since it was just the four of us, we had to learn a lot about how to start and run and maintain a business while also being healthy chamber ensemble or band. Yeah. So what was the, um, were there growing pains when you did that? Yeah, there, there definitely were. Cause I mean, the membership of the quartet was fixed yeah. already. Um, and it's, it's hard to actually force administrative roles on people who, yeah. um, who maybe don't have an interest or, or don't have the right sort of skill sets to do it. I mean, there's a reason businesses have long interview processes because people have really unique special skills. Um, yeah. And we didn't necessarily have those skills. <laughs> yeah. um, we had the motivation. Um, but so we, our administrative roles really changed a lot. Those are the major growing pains, uh-huh. just sort of finding out what fit best. Um, I would say that overall, like from the beginning, I was kind of like, the taskmaster for administrative stuff. Okay. But I wouldn't necessarily say I was good at it. I just was <laughs> motivated. Um, well, maybe and, that's all you need, really. Like, motivated enough to learn how to do something. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I like, learned how... I learned HTML so that I could build a website. It's funny. I mean, now that now that's ridiculous because of things like Squarespace or... Yeah. You know, there's, um, but, you know, I taught myself that language just to make a really terrible website actually (laughs) (laughs) um and learning how to you know run quickbooks or um or just general budgeting is something that was so foreign to, to run a business budget like a year and a half in advance um it was really interesting and also like understanding what the role of a board of directors is and how to utilize it. Yeah. Um, So, okay, let's go into that because how, so at this point you guys had this revelation, like we're going to, we're, we have to turn down other gigs. We have to go all in on this, making, making financial, um, making it work financially for all of us. So we can turn down other, other ways to make money. And then you have, then you have to build, the nonprofit. So like, what's your first step? What was your first step back then when you, when you realize it's time to start a nonprofit? Yeah. And I should say like the real initial impulse to start a nonprofit was so that we could apply for grants to commission new work okay. because we play new music and we, we couldn't commission these composers otherwise. Like right. They charge like $15,000 for a piece. Oh, wow. That's a lot. Okay. So mm-hmm. you're playing new music. You're playing new, mu- new music from people who are alive right now. That's right. So you yes. don't play like some old new music. <laughs> That's right. And the okay. so the the two unusual things about playing new string quartet music is that it costs a lot of money to commission the works. Uh-huh. Um, and it also takes a lot of time to learn the music. Right. Um, I think a, a lot of quartets that play standard music do play contemporary music maybe like one one big new piece a year or something. Um, and it takes like a considerable amount of time to to really understand the work and then get it into your touring repertoire. Um, we premiere about 70 pieces a year. Seven zero. And yes, and a lot of wow. them are maybe in the context of an educational situation, but we still learn them and perform them in a concert. Um, and we commission or have pieces commissioned on our behalf um, sometimes like 20 or 30 pieces a year. Um, so, and then we're also learning existing new music as well. So like the, okay. the time commitment is different. Um, and so once we sort of had the commissioning fundraising uh, under our belts and we had, you know, there's, there's sort of like a, there are known grants for that, okay. um, that we kind of got on a rotation with. Um, which we're really grateful. Um, then we started to get curious about raising funds to just help us exist, right. not for commissioning specifically, general operating. And that was, I think, the hardest thing for us uh, because none of us were particularly confident about the system um, and about how to represent ourselves in grants. Um, it's it's such a like a ballet, like a delicate dance you have to play with. Um, doing things that cost money before you necessarily have the funding to do those things. Um, Um, You know, so you you say, 
in the grant application, we're going to put on this concert with this music and this hall, and it's going to cost us all this money to do it. And we're doing it, and we need you to help support us so that we can do it. But we're doing it anyway. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> really interesting. You're like committing to, you know, going into debt potentially. Oh, wow. Um, was that but scary for you at it, first? It is scary. And I think that in the beginning, we sort of learned um, to to apply for funding to do projects that we knew we could do um, without getting the funding. And then if we did get the funding, then we could spend the money that we were going to spend on it doing other things. I see. Um, and so if we didn't get the funding, then we would just have less money. <laughs> I see. So you're <laughs> sort of like... It's sort of like remember that game where they would you hide a ball under the under the cups and you move them around. Yeah, <laughs> it seems like what that. Is, it's a, that's a scam, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're saying that fundraising is a scam. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of the Price Is Right. I don't know what you're thinking of. Oh uh, yeah, thinking right. Of, like yeah. those New York people that do that really yeah, fast. On the sidewalks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of like. Uh, you know, a game show from the 1980s. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, no, it's, no, it, it just seems a, like that. Like you're like over here, here's the money for this. And, but it seems, it seems like it'd be nerve wracking. Like, because you just, you guys are putting yourselves on the line. Like if, if we don't get this grant, we just said we're doing it still. What are we going to do? Put it on a credit card or what? Right. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and a lot of the grants don't give you the money, even if you, know that you receive the grant you don't get the grant until after the thing is done for instance <gasps> oh. the nea sends the check the year after the year the money is for oh my god this is you know this this is stuff people really don't know right <laughs> yeah and i i mean i didn't know it until until it was actually happening um but there's different categories of grants there's for instance commissioning or maybe recording grants grants specifically for international travel which is really helpful uh -huh. um but and then there's larger project grants because projects are complicated they might take three years you know maybe it's to commission stuff for a series of concerts that will then be recorded or something like multi-steps um okay and those grants are really complicated and i understand it from the grantors point of, point of view that they need to be really careful who they give money to yeah. um and we need to make sure that it's worthwhile. Um, so we have to somehow prove that to them. Um, Does it get easier now, now once you've been doing it for a while? Like they, other grants say, oh, they've gotten these other grants and they've been doing a good job. So we trust it. I do think there's an element of that. And it does get easier, yes. The, we get, we've gotten a lot better at feeling confident with our language and the way we represent ourselves in an application. Okay. We have more materials, more um, high quality video and recordings that really represent what we do. Uh -huh. um, and, and just getting used to the, to the sort of regular materials that are needed for it. Um, it just becomes a little bit more routine, um, but it's, it's never super easy and it's, but we're really grateful for it. And, uh, I would just like to say thank you to everyone who does support us because yeah. um, because we didn't know how to do this and we didn't plan for any of this to happen. Um, but it's it's really exciting that people do support it. It is awesome. So it sounds really like an art form to learn this delicate technique, you know, of writing writing it in the right way, telling telling a story, telling a a good story about what you guys do, right? I think so, yeah. That's so interesting. Do you do you do anything like Patreon or any of those things? We don't. That's sort of the next frontier for us is the is individual giving. Uh -huh. uh, our plan was when we so we did have a financial crisis as an organization. Uh, we were always growing. Every year we got more and more bookings, and um, and then over the and we weren't like I said we weren't particularly good at budgeting or keeping our books in order. Um, and it sort of ran away from us. I think at a point we sort of plateaued, but we kept spending more and we realized that we had like $80,000 in debt all of a sudden, which for a business, I guess, isn't that much, but to us, it, it was very personal and challenging for us. Yeah. 
And um, and it didn't take long for us to correct it. It took about two years to get back to normal. And now, because we learned so much from that real struggle, that we're we have really really beautiful spreadsheets that show us our cash flow like every two weeks for the next three years. Wow. And um, we we committed to applying for every single grant that we were aware of that we were eligible for. Um, and that increased our, I think that increased our grants, our grant income by like 300% or something like in the first year. Um, and, and now the next frontier is sort of learning how to navigate individual giving, Uh which is perhaps the most awkward (laughs) of the fundraising options. Um, we have, so why is it awkward? Is it, is it awkward to do the, the Patreon or to be like, Hey guys, want to support us? Like that kind of thing, or what do you find bring, awkward about it? I find that it, it brings money and sort of business into the personal realm mm-hmm. more. So foundations, their sole purpose is to give money. Um, maybe they have an endowment and they have to give off five or six percent of that endowment every year. Right. Um, and that's what they do, and they have a staff to do that. But individual giving is going to humans, often family or friends or acquaintances. Uh-huh. Um, in the community who uh, who maybe have a reputation for giving and supporting the arts, but not an application process. And so, so the, the actual um, exchange of money comes through a mutual interest, um, a desire on their part to be supporting the arts. And, but then also like an actual ask. Yeah. And I find that to be, I find that to be awkward if it's not natural. Sometimes it happens very naturally and and it's beautiful. I think, you know, one one of the things I think of is, you know, I know some people in our circle who are supporters of the arts and they have, you know, they're they're wealthy. And mm-hmm. you know that they're getting asked a lot, you know? So maybe mm-hmm. that's part of it. Like you, you want to, it's just asking the same people because you know there's like a handful of people who you know have cash or have money that they do give to the arts already and you're like hey can you give me some of that (laughs) you know like maybe that's why it feels strange I don't know yeah and I don't think anyone likes to view people with dollar signs in their eyes you know Uh uh, because we like to I, mean, as, I think humans generally like to have normal human relationships with each other. Um, and and I imagine that people who do have a significant amount of money don't like to be viewed just as a wallet, you know? Right. Um, and, and for a long time, we just didn't have relationships with people who have money. And, and so there was like this weird combination of you know, who, who can we ask to help support us? But then even if we identified who to ask, it felt, it still felt sort of unnatural. And I I would say that what's starting to change with us is, well, first of all, we never, we never really did get, we we never really did learn how to do that. I think what we started doing is just focusing on what we want to be doing, uh, which is putting on concerts of new music and commissioning, artists to write music and I think we've found that people are interested in what we're doing and and they want to support it that makes sense so the we sort of took the game out of it we just I think we stopped worrying about how to how to ask friends to support us generally and instead just committed to doing the projects that people want to support. That makes sense. And ultimately you got to feel comfortable with how you're going about that. So, so that's great that you figured that out for yourselves. And like for Patreon, you're figuring it out (laughs) currently. And I think it'll be an ongoing process because it's so different from being like, can you give money to the symphony or the opera? Because it's like this big, It's like a bigger organization maybe. And now you're just like, hi, we're four people and we're doing this, this very specific thing, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
it is tough. And I think this is a conversation that I'm really glad we're having it because it's, I remember when I first found out that, I mean, <laughs> clearly I wasn't doing any math, but I thought that you just played concerts and the fact that people paid tickets, paid money for tickets was how it got paid. And I didn't figure like, okay, an orchestra has 80 people and they all make this much salary. And like, that doesn't match with the ticket sales, you know, like it's not, that's not how it's happening. And I remember the first time I figured out the reason why people get paid to play music majority of the time, like when they have jobs and orchestras is because of donations. I was like, really? Like this is a long time ago, of course, but mm -hmm. you know, cause you don't learn that when you're just learning your instrument or when you're in high school youth orchestra. So, you know, it's just, it's just an interesting component and then now, now that you're running your own business, that's a big part of what you're, what you need to do. Yeah, and and I, I would say that string quartet is very lucky that we can act as a band, kind yeah. of in that in a in a sense that we are still choosing how much time to put into it, which is, I mean, I guess that's according to our own standards. But we we rehearse all the time. We're about to rehearse today, and. Um, we're probably going to learn a bunch of new music today. And, That's great. Uh, and it's fun. Um, but orchestras, orchestras are really a completely different game because they have to pay certain amounts for a certain amount of time. Yeah. And there's no getting around it. Yeah, absolutely. And so did you decide to start a Patreon? Like, that's sort of, that's not really a direct ask, actually. It's just having your, you know, support us generally for a monthly you know, monthly draft, you know, and I think people are used to supporting, not supporting. I, I support Netflix every week, every month. I mean, you know, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> like it goes out and you don't think about it. So, you know, there, there's a lot of things that people pay for per month that, um, you know, like one of the things I pay for is medium.com. It's a blog mm -hmm. platform yeah. and it's only $5 a month. And, Sometimes I look at my credit card statement, and I'm like, oh, yeah, what's that? that? That's going out every month. But I would be mad if I went to Medium and I couldn't read what I wanted to read, you know? So. Yeah, it's interesting. We, you know, we don't, we don't do anything like that currently. Um, most of our uh, individual support comes from meeting with people we know who are interested in supporting the arts and asking for a specific amount to support it. Or or just gauging how much they're interested in supporting it. So if it's a commissioning um, project, you, you know, then it's very, it's very clear what they're supporting. You know, we need X amount of money to commission this yeah. person. Um, and then they say what they're willing to contribute. Um, but I think that things like Patreon or um, I'm trying to think, or even just sort of regular support like that is, in a way, I mean, I I think you know more about it than I do. It's, a, it's, a, it's like the next frontier for us. Yeah. Well, cool. It'll be interesting to see where, where you go from there. So what what do you um, – here's a question. You, you said that you guys really had to navigate the business skills between the four of you. And then you said two people have since moved on. You guys have been together for 13 years. Is that right? Since 2005, yeah. Okay, so – that's a long time. That's great. And so two people have moved on. Um, and when you got the two, the players to replace them, were they friends or people that you already knew? And were you like, hey, can you also do QuickBooks? Like, how did that work? <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, playing the instruments uh, is the primary focus. Um, and oh. everything else is... Um, it's sort of lucky if everything else works. Uh, in, in our case, I, I think we're very lucky that the four of us balance each other well um, administratively. We have different strengths and interests uh -huh. and different levels of organization. Um, and, it, and it's working for us now. Um, I think that uh, for groups that maybe don't have a well-balanced administrative ability, um, then instead of forcing it on the players, I think it's good to find ways to hire staff or help that is good at it. And 
And similarly, I think for a group like us who maybe is making it work now, it's important to know when it is time to bring in outside help. Um, because if if we don't, and we do, we actually we don't have any other staff, but we work with a lot of um, like independent contractors okay. uh, for publicity and bookkeeping and grant writing and um, and. And I think that if we didn't do that, then we would crumble, basically. We'd, you have to know. That's another delicate ballet is knowing when to grow and when to ask for help. That makes sense. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Like, I know that you have a PR firm because that's how I, how I got connected with you to do this interview. And um, when did you decide to do that? And, and do they do your social media? Like, how does that work? Um, well, we... So we had been just been doing it sort of randomly. There wasn't even a real strategy, uh-huh. just in-house. And uh, I think we we looked ahead and we saw that there were a number of really exciting things to share that we knew we weren't going to be able to to effectively share while also being a quartet. And it happened it happened kind of quickly. But um, in addition, so social media is something that we feel comfortable doing, you know, it's very, we can just, most of our social media is sort of like dumb videos and dumb pictures, pictures of us doing dumb things. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, But we were not good at sending press releases um, and having a strategy for how to roll out news. And, Uh and so we, we sort of suddenly committed that. And, and then in turn that freed us up um, to do other administrative work. Yeah. So you were like, this is, this is something we don't want to navigate. So let's reach out to somebody. Basically. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's limits. It's like, I, yeah. wait, I, I'm stressed out by the prospect of doing this. Whereas there are other things that don't stress us out, you know, like we can write a grant um, and maybe the time is stressful, but it's not like a, a wall of stress. That's a good barometer. <laughs> is this minor stress or is this a wall of stress? <laughs> so if it's a wall of stress, you say, who can we hire to help us? Basically, yeah. That sounds good. That's, that's great. That's good advice because I think I'm sure it was a big load off to have a PR firm managing that because especially, especially Andrew and, and uh, Unison Media, like they, they know who to contact where and what and how. So it's one less thing you have to think about. Definitely. And they're fun. Yeah. Yeah. They're great. So, um, so how do you find your composers? Like, I know you have, you just said you have 70, um, commissions a year. How does that? Yeah. It's, it's sort of, sort of three ways we reach composers. One is something we do a lot of is going to different schools and festivals where, where you, composers are learning uh-huh. and and the schools or festivals will often bring us in to work with them for a period of time maybe a week or anywhere from three weeks to one day um and then uh we will either read their pieces uh and get recordings of them which is good for their portfolios for like applying to other programs or we'll actually work with them and perform their works on a program um which allows us to get a little bit deeper into it. And um, so we meet a lot of composers that way who then maybe after they're in school, we continue to work with. And that's happened a lot over the course of these last, like the last decade. But then there's also composers we just have a, a general interest in that we've like come into contact. However, you know, th- just from the internet or f- hearing their music performed in concerts or through recommendations of friends. Um, so it's kind of like a wish list of, known composers um, and then presenters actually also put us in touch with composers a lot um, okay. presenters who present new music have their own agenda which is often really cool because they're putting together a festival or a season that is you know really artistically strong um, and so we do make a lot of relationships through their recommendations and especially if they're willing to commission a piece for us yeah. So do you do you have to pay for every single one, or are there ever people who are like, we just wanna, we just want the exposure. We want to do this. Sort of all of the above. That okay. so often presenters will commission directly and will never have to handle money. 
Um, sometimes composers do just write pieces for us, but we don't feel good about that because right. we are privileged with with funding, uh, and so it doesn't feel right to um, allow composers to give us work pro bono, basically. Um, and then there are grants we apply for who, so they'll give us money and then we'll give that money to the composers. Okay. Um, and then there's something new we've started, which uh, we just announced on March 1st, which is a commissioning project for us to provide six commissions a year to composers who may otherwise not have access to institutions like Jack Quartet or the schools that we visit or the festivals we visit. Great. Um, and it was an application deadline and we received 400 and about 450 applications that we're still processing right now um and it's totally inspiring i feel like i want to commission 300 composers Um, (laughs) (laughs) that's great so are you going to do that again next year yeah i think we're going to do it every year um it's, it's sort of our way of of reaching artists we otherwise that who we otherwise don't have access to um just because we don't know about them right and and then we also just want to sort of broaden our our community the classical music is such a bubble already and then the new music part of classical music is an even smaller bubble and so as much as we can we like to break that bubble yeah so what's the project called it's called the fulcrum project okay um and it's going to be an annual commissioning project uh, with a call for applications in the spring and then a performance of six new commissions the following year. And in between that time, there'll be a series of workshops, opportunities for the artists to work with mentors who we can arrange for them and, um, and just general support of, and like uplifting of their profiles. That sounds great. So every every spring there's a deadline. So it's like, do you have this specific date for the deadline? Yeah. Well, we just had our first one, which was on March 1st. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. The application was March 1st. Uh, the deadline was May 1st. Okay. We're currently processing. Um, it's a long process to get through everything. Um, and we're going to announce the six artists uh, in June or July um, and then start work workshopping with them as early as the fall um, and have more intensive workshops closer to the performance in the spring. What do you do in the workshops? Uh, it really depends on the artist. It's completely open to anyone to apply. Anyone can apply of any age from anywhere in the world. Um, and because of that, I think we're going to be coming into contact with artists who work in lots of different ways which is sort of the point. Yeah. Um, so some artists might actually prefer to just write a piece and don't need a lot of interaction or prefer not to have, uh, and other, others I think really benefit from just spending time with us. And it's possible that what we end up workshopping will have nothing to do with the final product, but it will have something to do with their creative process. Great. So basically if someone's hearing this right now and they're a composer or they know a composer and they want to share it, um, they can start to prepare for spring 2020. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So, wow, it sounds like a really great opportunity. And it's a win-win because composers can get their work out there. You can get more work to play. So that's awesome. So do you ever do you ever play music for, like, fine, fine pieces and you're like, uh, I don't really like it? <laughs> Well, it's it's a it's a little bit of a different attitude uh, because a lot of the times when we're well, basically every time we're playing a piece, it's for a performance. And so, just as performers, when we're preparing to be on stage performing something, we have to have a certain level of commitment, no matter what. Okay. Um, and there are pieces that are more frustrating than others, uh, maybe because of weird technical demands or sometimes the composers themselves are challenging to get along with. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> not surprising. <laughs> and, um, but that's like, usually not the case. Usually the composers we work with are cool and the pieces are, are exciting to work on. Um, it's pretty unique when we're posed with sort of challenges that um, are unresolvable. Okay. So like, so, Basically, 
I'm hearing you say that it doesn't really matter if you like it because you're looking at it as like, this is art taking away, maybe taking away the component of subjectiveness. Like I'm not necessarily going to judge if I like this or not. I'm just going to, I'm performing this piece. Uh, well, you know, part of me that resonates with me a little bit, but I think I take for granted that we do have really strong artistic preferences and interests and um, I think that because of maybe uh, how long we've been around and the relationships that we have, we're able to play music that we really do like a lot um, and avoid music or working with artists who are who maybe we don't get along with as well. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, we're generally likable and um, affable people. <laughs> I think that we can, you know, if you know how to, if you can smile, like we'll get along. But um, <laughs> So it's, we're not, it's not challenging usually, um, but I think we're privileged that way that we, string quartets already have so much music to choose from. And, yeah. um, and then Jack Quartet has so many relationships with composers that we work with great people. That's great. And, I re- and the other thing I wanted to ask is, I remember back when I was in civic orchestra, we did this series with new music where we were, we were essentially helping them out by reading their piece and we were going to perform it, but it was, they were students and they Uh were learning. Um, and so, um, there were things that like, maybe something was written in a way that could have been written so that it was easier to read. And so like, are there ever things where you go, maybe that's part of the workshop, right? Where you're reading it and you're going, you know what, if you, if you would, instead of writing it with like, 30 second no <laughs> ties can you just make it in 16 no or like you change yeah. you know like you change the time signature to make it like more doable or are there things like that that you help composers with definitely i mean it's, it's something we love to do is get really into the nitty-gritty of notation we're yeah. not super i think we know when like we choose our battles with that because sometimes there maybe there's a time constraint and it's not necessarily worth it to spend time on the fine details of notation. But then there are other times when composers seem to really have a good grasp on it, but maybe there's just like one little detail that would really, you know, put the like finishing touches on, on something. Yeah. Um, we're, we're game to, to get really deep into it and talk about what's most effective. But in the end, what's most important is that we as human beings understand what they're going for artistically, um, that it's not, it's not about the notation. That's just like a fun hobby in a way is to get the notation really clear. We've created a style guide. um, That's just like a document in progress that we're always updating with our preferences for how we see things written. And when we go, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. And then it helps us to, to really understand what our preferences are. And then when we go to schools or if we're working with a composer um, before they've written a piece, we can send it to them and it just saves a lot of time and, yeah. I mean, not yeah. to geek out about that stuff, but like I remember in that situation and, and I don't have nearly the, you know, the experience with new music that you do, but I remember having sort of a context shift a shift for me about um new music because for me as a horn player and just going growing up in the orchestra world, like every time we'd play new music, I was like this is really hard, you know, and it's the <laughs> rhythms are so more complex and And then I was like, oh, well, you know what? It's kind of like a math problem to figure out to count this correctly. And then and then it was further for that, which was, well, if it was written like this, maybe that would be easier for people who are just learning how to read this or whatever. So that's why I brought it up, because I think I think new music, at least for people who don't aren't used to seeing it all the time. Sometimes you look at it and you're like, yikes. How am I going to get through that? You know, so I guess not all of it is super complex rhythms or whatever, but some of it is. So, um, so that's why I was just curious about that. Yeah, I think it, I think it's fun. And I think there are pretty like fairly objective ways to write complicated rhythms and complicated harmony, um, in a, in a clear and understandable way. Yeah. Um, and that's fun. what's really interesting is when composers are doing complicated and unusual things that aren't necessarily rhythmic, or harmonically really, you know, that it's more about like sound effects or just unusual techniques that they created. And, yeah. um, and that's when, that's actually when I don't 
get as strict about it um, because it's more of like a creative, a new way of expressing something. And yeah, um, and no one else has really done it, and maybe never will. That's fun. That sounds like fun. So, if you had to narrow down a couple pieces of pieces of advice for musicians who are listening to this and going, I want a career like that. How do I do that? Um, yeah. So random bits of advice. Uh, yeah. I think one for any performing artist, uh, just play as much as you can. Um, the Kronos Quartet told us that early on we did a workshop with them and because they told us to do that, we did program a bunch of concerts in New York at like hole in the wall places um, where we weren't getting any money, but we learned so much music and we gained at least a local reputation for playing a certain kind of music that no one else was. That's cool. Um, and we just got a lot of experience. Um, I think performing a lot is extremely important. Um, and, uh, other advice, uh, would be to learn how to make a budget. <laughs> I think that is one of the most important things for any, any musician who's making money off of music. Yeah. That's great advice. It's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to make a budget and stick to it. Do you mean, do you mean like a business budget or like I shouldn't buy $6 Starbucks every day? <laughs> well, both in a way, I mean, from the business point of view, it's more about not overspending. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe don't buy, you know, $6 with the Starbucks every day on the business card. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but what if it's a business meeting? <laughs> that's a good point. If it's a business meeting, then you should spend more than six dollars. Okay, <laughs> that's good advice that, too. Right? Yeah, that's my <laughs> yeah, that's my most important advice. Okay, um, I think yeah, I think the budget and also just knowing how to like understanding general basic accounting is just incredibly helpful. Right. Um, and we learned it the hard way for years. We struggled to, and we were successful at getting it done. Um, and then, as I said before, we had like a financial crisis, the great yeah. financial crisis of 2015 <laughs> and, um, and, uh, it forced us to really understand it. And I wish if I had just taken like an online tutorial in the beginning and I think I could have avoided that. Really? Okay. That's really good advice. Hindsight is mm -hmm. 2020, right? So what about, and before we leave the accounting piece do you do you have an accountant that you use for your taxes we've gone in and out of it so nonprofits have to just send a, a form 990 to the irs every year uh -huh. um so we don't pay the business doesn't pay taxes but we have to report all of our finances to the government right um and uh in the beginning i I had QuickBooks on my computer and filled out the 990 myself, which is impossible to believe. And then eventually we had a CPA doing the 990. And then eventually they also had, we also had a CPA doing the books. And then funnily enough, that's when we got into trouble because we weren't keeping an eye on it. Oh, we um, were like, yeah, someone's doing it. We're good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny because like, they, yeah, yeah, they were keeping it organized, but not, you know, running the show. Um, right. And then we took everything back into our own hands actually. And, um, and now we've, now we're working with a fiscal administrator. This is something that's sort of new to me, but it's like it's somebody who manages all of the finances so that if we need to pay a bill or pay someone else, um, they do it on our behalf. And what's a fiscal administrator? It's, I mean, it, quite literally, it's someone who administers all of the finances. Okay. Um, this, so they keep the books in order. Um, I think it's it's relatively. I haven't heard of many organizations who do it, but it's great because they're professional accountants uh -huh. um, who work on behalf of artists who don't know anything about accounting. That sounds great. But of course, to to outsource accounting to a fiscal administrator or a CPA or just a bookkeeper requires having enough money to pay them to do it. Right. So it's a little bit, you have to get to a certain point before it's worth spending that money. Yeah. And then you still have to keep an eye on your stuff yourself too. So, cause you're still mm -hmm. spending, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, that's great. That's, that's really super valuable. So 
Do you have anything that you'd like to promote coming up? Um, let's see. Uh, so I talked about the Fulcrum project, which is our commissioning yes. project. And I'll put um, a link, also, like I'll get a link from you so people can find out all the information they need. I'll put that in the show notes. Oh, great. Yeah. It's all on our website. Okay. Uh, there's a projects tab. Okay. Um, also there in the projects tab is, um, uh, the fr- our Jack Frontiers, which is a new annual series of performances beginning in December, 2019, uh, and this is our opportunity to perform in New York City pieces that we've commissioned uh, and that we really believe in. Uh, it's completely Jack curated, um, and we're doing it at the new school uh, where we are the quartet and residents at the Manus School of Music. Uh-huh. Um, there's a really great hall called Tishman Auditorium uh, right um, in downtown Manhattan. Um, where we'll do it. And this first year, we're premiering or playing new pieces that we commissioned from Taishan Sori, Lester St. Louis, Catherine Lamb, and Clara Iannata. Um, it's going to be four really incredible pieces. Wow, that sounds great. Yeah, and we're going to do it every year. I with love different it. Pieces. <laughs> this is so great. Okay, I love everything you're doing, and I'm super excited about this conversation. It's been so valuable. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and you've been listening to Crushing Classical Podcast. You can follow Crushing Classical on Instagram and Facebook at Crushing Classical. If you haven't yet, you can go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review. Your review helps others to find these conversations. Thank you so much for listening.